It is my pleasure to welcome Paul Arna Ostver, who will tell us about motivic homotopy theory at infinity. So thanks a lot, Dan, for this opportunity to give this talk in your, in your seminar. So um, as you said, the title is motivic homotopy theory at infinity. And the really only new thing here is, is really at the end of the sentence at infinity. So this is what I want to try to explain during the talk. And I should say that this is um, this work. This is really still a work in progress, and it's joined with my fantastic collaborators, Frederic de Gries and Adrian Duvalo. So I'll, I plan to put these notes out on ResearchGate as well. So of course you don't need to take any notes or anything. So if all goes well, this talk will be in let's see three parts. So I want to spend some time on motivating our construction. Um, so the first part will be some recollections about motivic homotopy theory. Probably you know all this before, but <clears throat> I, I sort of want to, my hope is to convince you that it's worthwhile to develop this subject of motivic homotopy theory at infinity. Um, and then the second part will be topology at infinity. And this is sort of a classical notion from topology. Where, so by, by at infinity, I. I mean that we study topological properties of complements of compact uh, subspaces into some ambient space. Um, in particular, we, um, there are some nice invariants such as um, pi one at infinity, the, the fundamental group at infinity and also homology groups at infinity. And these invariants have been very successful um, in, in the theorem of manifolds, but also in algebraic geometry uh, since the late 1960s, so there are some examples that I want to remind you about. And then the last part, um, stable motivic homotopy types will really just be a series of comments on ongoing work. Um, <clears throat> and I can say that our sort of our overall general aim with this work is to is to get a get at a homotopical understanding of smooth affine varieties and sort of in a similar way that we we understand open contractible manifolds. Um, okay, so I maybe I should also mention our sponsor, the, the Center for Advanced Study at the Academy of Science and, and Letters in, in Oslo. So I, um, I'm, I'm leading a program called Motivic Geometry. So please check that out if you haven't already done that. We have almost weekly seminars and so on. Okay, so let's start with a recap of motivic homotopy theory. So on this slide, I'm going to sort of declare my love for motivic spaces. I, I think of motivic spaces um, <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a place where both schemes and simplicial sets, they, they live together and they live happily together. So, so let's um, fix a base scheme B. Um, for example, you can you can take a field, and then we can look at smooth schemes over B. And of course, in here we have all sorts of interesting objects. The ones that are sort of re mostly relevant for motivic homotopy theory are affine spaces, projective spaces, the multiplicative group scheme. Later in the talk, we'll uh, say some words about um, what's called the Coras Russell freefold. And we'll also be mentioning Daniletsky surfaces. So there's so for each natural number n greater or equal to one, there's an interesting surface called a Daniletsky surface. And we'll talk a bit about um, the sort of the motivic homotopy theory of, of that surface. Okay, so the idea is to, to take in order to do some homotopy theory for schemes, we, we sort of want to mix it up with simplicial sets. So here we have spheres and simplices and nerves of categories and whatnot. And then we embed both of these categories into the category of motivic spaces. And uh, schemes, for schemes, we just use the unit embedding. And for simplicial sets, we just take the constant functor. So, uh, so in here, so a motivic space is just a contravariant functor from smooth schemes over B into simplicial sets. So in, in particular, uh, any simplicial set defines a constant motivic space. The, it has the same value on, on each um, scheme. Okay, so um, 
So I think emotivic spaces are some 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 intelligent way of freeing up or freely adjoining all sorts of co-limits to smooth schemes. Um, and once we have this sort of free object, we can talk about the projective or the free model structure. This is now possible just by defining weak equivalences and vibrations scheme-wise, because we can evaluate such functors on schemes and check if the result is, is a weak equivalence or, or a vibration in simplicial sets where we already have a standard homotopy theory. Okay, so, so this procedure becomes really interesting when we, when we choose the relations that we want to impose. And the first relation is a, sort of a um, local condition. So let me, let me state it in this more simple way, just for, just for my Viatoris squares for open coverings of a scheme. So if you have a covering of a, of a scheme X by two opens U and V, we can look at this standard square. <clears throat> and if you look at this, this square in, in schemes, it is a push out, but it's no longer a push out in, in uh, motivic spaces, but we have a sort of a homotopical fix for this that we declare that any such square as a, is a homotopy push out. Okay. So that's the local condition, and this is sort of the, called the local model structure. And then the, um, we also have a way of param parameterizing homotopies, and they are parameterized along the affine line. So if you take any, any scheme, x and smooth over b, you take its cylinder and the projection down to x again, this is also declared to be a weak equivalence. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is sort of the Sarvisky condition in this square here. And uh, what we really do is, uh, is, is talk about Misnevich squares, but let's, let's just leave it with this here. It's really the same idea. To make it precise, we need to use the theory of um, the, or the technique of Boswell localization for motivic spaces. Um, so one, one a consequence of um, this Maivia-Torres squares is that we can also view P1 as, as a smash product of S1, the simplicial circle, and GM. That's sort of the standard first example of a calculation we have with these type of, types of squares. Okay, maybe I should pause and ask if there are any questions. As always, feel free to, feel free to interrupt. You can also um, put questions in the chat and I'll, I'll be monitoring that and I can relay those questions to Paul Arna if you prefer to do it that way. Okay, so, <clears throat> so this idea of parameterizing homotopies along A1 was put into system by Morel Bobatsky and they ended up with a notion of uh, say A1 weak equivalences between motivic spaces. And um, once we um, invert those weak equivalences or the A1 weak equivalences, we end up with a homotopy category of B, the unstable motivic homotopy category. And there's also a stable version of that obtained from the pointed version where we invert P1, pointed at infinity. And there's a sort of a, a, a standard loop suspension or junction between the un unstable setting and the, and the stable setting. Okay, so some of the power of this theory comes from the fact that there's a, there's a, there's a theory of a six functor formalism, formalism for, for this construction. There's a huge literature on the subject. It was started by Wawatsky and it was developed by Ayub. Uh, also Runding, Rundings and Sisinski de Glees and uh, Oyewa has also very nice expositions of this this theory <clears throat> that I'm going to say a little bit about. So, so functoriality is about what happens when we, we change the base scheme. So um, I, I want to let, I want to vary B, the variable B. So let's take a, a map of schemes, call it F from T to S. And then <clears throat> associated to F, we have various sort of base change functors. <clears throat> the adjunction that, um, so I'm going to write about a bunch of adjunctions and the left adjoints will always be on top. So F upper star will be a left adjoint to F lower star. So um, 
So these are sort of the, <clears throat> the standard functors, sort of uh, inverse image and direct image functors that exist for any F, any, any map of schemes F. So we're gonna be using that. And <clears throat> we're also gonna be using the um, exceptional functors so F lower shriek and F upper shriek. And here we notice here that the functor reality is a little bit different. F lower shriek is now the left adjoint. So, so, the, so we have T here instead of S. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna say a little bit more about F lower shriek in the next page. So in the event that F is smooth, F O, F upper star also has have a left adjoint, F lower sharp. Um, and I forgot to say, I'm sorry, let's let's go back to this adjunction here. For for the existence here, we need to assume that F is a separated of finite type. Okay, so there's there's a little bit of, of a condition there for this 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 to exist, but nonetheless, it's very general. Okay, so in some cases, we can really kind of identify F lower, lower shriek. So <clears throat> this is kind of all we need to know about F lower shriek. So um, if F happens to be proper, then F lower shriek equals F lower star. <clears throat> and if F is an open immersion, it, it, it's equals to F lower sharp. And <clears throat> The reason why this is sort of determines F lower shriek is that with the assumption that F is separable of finite type, you can always factor it as an open immersion followed by proper mor morphism. So first factor it as an open immersion followed by proper map. This is called the Nagata compactification theorem. And then, then you can simply define F lower shriek as a composition of such two functors using the factorization. And we also have some useful properties for F upper, upper shriek that it equals F upper star if F is, um, F is a tall. Okay, so the sole purpose that I want to remind you about this is that these functors that will appear when we define the stable motivic homotopy type at infinity of, of any scheme. So maybe it's good to remind you about this. Then, Let's be a little bit more concrete <clears throat> and say we fix a base scheme that's a field and say it has characteristic zero. And I really hope that more people will get interested in this, this, this question here. I think it's a very natural question to ask. So um, I want to restrict say that X is a smooth affine scheme over, over the field. And we can ask when such a scheme is, is A1 contractible, meaning that the, the, the structure map down to, to spec of the field, so the base is, a, is an A1 weak equivalence. So, so there's a fairly up-to-date survey paper about this by Asok and, 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 and myself called A1 homotopy theory and contractible varieties. So, so there's a warning, maybe I should say there's a warning, you shouldn't open this, this paper here if you're allergic to conjectures because there are a lot of conjectures in this paper, but hopefully also somebody you can find inspiring. <clears throat> okay, so just to illustrate how little we know about this question, let me ask another question, um, which is still open. And this has to do with affine spaces. So we can ask the following, is AN, the affine N space, the only A1 contractible smooth affine F scheme or dimension less or equal to two? We're just talking about a line and a, and, and a plane. <laughs> and uh, what we know is that it's, um, this is actually true for curves. So in dimension one, it's, it's okay. Um, still, we don't know it for, for surfaces. This is still open. So if you, if you want to, Want to try an interesting problem about A1 contractible varieties? Then here is one. There's a discussion about this in in a paper by De Boulot and Sabrina Pauling and me 
in this A1 contractibility of affine modifications. So we're sort of close to proving, kind of close to proving it for surfaces, but not quite. So sort of the latest news for surfaces is, is in that, that paper there if you're, if you're interested in this. Okay, um, then this KR, the, um, the chorus Russell threefold that I mentioned in the very beginning, this is a smooth affine threefold and it's defined by this equation that you see in front of you here, this x plus x squared y plus c squared plus t cubed equals zero. That seems easy enough, right? Doesn't seem too complicated. Um, and it turns out that this here is, this is a smooth affine A1 contractible threefold. And in fact, it's the first example of such a, of a smooth affine variety, which we know is A1 contractible, but it's not an affine space. Um, and you may wonder about this exponents here, that there's a two and there's a three. And the only really important thing is that two and three are co-prime. I mean, you can, you can make this, this, this equation a little bit more general, but this is sort of the basic, basic version of it. So, Lots of people worked on this question. Was Arvin Asok initiated the study of the, or the A1 homotopy theory of, of KR? Uh, Oiva, uh, Krishna, and me, we, we proved that K, KR was contractible uh, in, in SH, so a stable contractibility result. Um, and this was refined by Duvalo and Fassel. That, that finished off the proof and showed that KR is really A1 contractible in the unstable homotopy category. Oh, and I have a question. How, yeah, right. how far is stably contractible from be, having vanishing motivic cohomology groups? That's how we prove that it is a stably contractible. So once you prove that the, the, the child groups or the motivic cohomology of this of KR is the same as the base field, then you can use a slice spectral sequence argument to conclude that it's actually stably contractible. So that, that's really the, the core of the argument. So, right. So in fact, if you, once you know that you have, if you have a smooth, um, smooth affine variety, your smooth typical homology is the same as the base, then you can, can use some magic with slice spectral sequences um, or slice filtration to, to conclude that the same variety is, is stably A1 contractible. But then of course, there's always this tension between the unstable and the stable categories that if even if something is stably contractible, you, can't you can only conclude that a certain, certain suspension of the, of the variety is, is A1 contractible in the unstable uh, category. But, but Dubolo and Fossell really, really showed that the, it was the, really the, the zero suspension that was saying one contractible, so that was great. Right, any more questions about that example? Okay, I wanna to, want to talk a little bit more about KR because I, I think it's a, a, an amusing example. So I'm going to give you some facts about it. So KR is a so-called exotic A3. Um, and that means two things. That as, an, as a variety is not A3, we can distinguish between KR and A3 algebraically. And there's a geometric argument here on this page that I will sketch for you, um, at least uh, sort of the, the salient features that we need for KR to conclude this fact here. There's also another way of doing this by computing the Makalimanov invariant of KR. So the Makalimanov invariant is, is the sort of a, a measure for the abundance of all GA actions. So actions of, the, of A1 considered as an, as an algebraic group on, on KR. And that turns out to be different for KR and A3. Now, topologically, it's true that the, the complex points of KR is, is a copy of R6. So the, so the Euclid, six dimensional Euclidean space and this isomorphism here is even a diffeomorphism. And this follows from showing that, that the C points of KR is a, is a contractible topological space. 
Okay, so <clears throat> to show that KR is not A3, we can use that KR is fiber over the affine, affine line, the variable X, and then study the various fibers. Um, so if you look at the fiber over, over, over the close point zero, just looking at the equations, then we see that we find one copy of, of A1 in the variable Y, and then a, a, a given by this equation here. So it's this cusp here, and it's the, it's the cylinder on, on that. So it's what's often called the open book surface. So, so that fiber is a little special because all the other closed fibers, they, are, they can be identified with A2. And there's, there's a result due to, to Kalimann that the, from 2002 that, that uses this pretty simple calculations um, to distinguish KR from, from, from A3. Because, because Kalimann proves that if you have a regular map from, from A3 to A1, whose generic fiber is, is, um, is A2, then all the other closed fibers are also a copy of A2. And this fails for KR because the fiber of a zero is, is this is open book surface. So it's a, it's a really beautiful geometric argument to, to show that. And another reason why people are interested in this KR is that it's a potential counterexample to the Sarisky cancellation conjecture, which says the following, say we take X as smooth affine variety, say over the complex numbers, just to be concrete, then if the cylinder on X is an affine space, does it follow that X is affine as well? Mm. So this, this conjecture is open in, over the complex numbers. It's known to be fail to it's known to fail over um, in positive characteristic. Uh, the positive results is that it's true in dimension. Well, it's true for curves and and, and surfaces. And this this is sort of a classical result from the 70s and uh, maybe early 80s, and it uses deep results in birational geometry to establish this. Okay, so the message um, here is that despite all the sophistication of, of, of motivic homotop theory, we're not able to distinguish between KR and, and KR. So maybe you feel just like me that this is not very satisfactory. So, um, <clears throat> so, Let's let's look to topology and and see see if there's some inspiration we can draw from from a theory of open manifolds. So here's one of my favorite theorems. This is equivalent to the generalized Poincaré conjecture, and this is a characterization of the Euclidean space R n dimension three and so on that it's the unique open contractible n-manifold that's simply connected at infinity. So here's this at infinity that we have to have to add to this condition. And simply connected at infinity means that the fundamental group at infinity vanishes. So here's sort of the Wikipedia definition of <laughs> what it means to be simply connected at infinity. So let me just Let's just focus on this. This is it. and it really gives the, the right idea. So, so a manifold M say has trivial pi one at infinity. So how do we check that? Well, we have to check at every compact subspace C of M. We have to come up with another compact subspace C prime between C and M. And then we look at the complements and the induced maps on pi one. And the condition is that this map here is trivial. Okay, so, <clears throat> so the intuition is that is what I've written here is that loops far away from a small subspace can be collapsed. So if you want one example or two examples, I mean, we can, we can look at pi one infinity of the complex numbers. That's a copy of the integers. But while pi one infinity of a point is, um, is zero. In fact, pi one infinity of anything that's compact is, is, is zero. Okay, so, so we're far, quite far away from, 
from establishing such a result for, for varieties, but this is sort of the type of uh, result that we're trying to gravitate towards, towards, but of course a lot of work remains here. So <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is sort of a, a, a first approximation to invariance that can eventually give such a conjecture for, for algebraic varieties. Okay, so a somewhat easier invariant than pi one at infinity are the so-called homology groups at infinity. Uh, again, <clears throat> this is a, another invariant and that helps us distinguish between spaces that are not homotopy equivalent. Okay, so these are the homology or, uh, at infinity is no longer a homotopy uh, invariant. And there's a nice textbook here called Ends of Complexes which is a long exposition of this theory. So the important part for us is the following. So say W is a topological space, then here, I hope you can see my cursor moving. So here we have the singular chain complex of W. We also have uh, the locally finite singular chain complex where we sort of, where the chains are more general um, I mean, there's sort of formal infinite sums where there's a condition on, on compact subspaces of, of, of W. And the homology here, the homology of this complex are the, often called the borel moore homology groups of W. And the, the chain complex, at inf the singular chain complex of W at infinity is just defined here to fit into this distinguished triangle. So of course we view this as chain complexes of abelian groups. Okay, so it's a, it's sort of like a homotopy fiber of this natural map from from chain from chains to locally finite chains. And the associated homology groups at infinity are are just the homology of this chain complex. Okay. So I should say that if, if W is compact, then all these homology groups at infinity are, are trivial, okay? Because the map, then singular homology and more more homology are, 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 are isomorphic. Okay, so, so these invariants have been used in algebraic geometry to study interesting examples. This Staniletsky surfaces, this Dn here, N is a positive number positive integer. So we have this simple equation here in A3, say over the over field F. Um, so the first homology group at infinity has been used to distinguish between or distinguish topologically between the Danielewski surfaces. Turns out that H1 infinity is cyclic water 2N. And these surfaces are kind of interesting because they're counterexamples to what we can call a generalized Sariski cancellation theorem, namely the the cylinders, so M and N are different, different integers. Nonetheless, the, cylind the cylinder on, on those surfaces are, are isomorphic as varieties. Okay. And uh, this is just, I guess, one of the very few ways that we, we can distinguish between the surfaces topologically. We really need this uh, H1 at infinity to do this. Okay, so when we move to the motivic world, I want to take this, this distinguished triangle here as a, a sort of a starting point. So here's the last part of this talk. So now we're going to be talking about stable motivic homotopy types. So we're going to let F be a separable map of finite type X over the base scheme B. And now we can quite easily define the stable motivic homotopy type at infinity of X by a similar distinguished square, or if, if you want, if you prefer, a, a homotopy exact sequence. So, oops. So this term here with infinity at, this is the stable motivic homotopy type at infinity of X. Um, this term in the middle is, is uh, well, this is the stable motivic homotopy type of, of, of X, nothing at infinity. 
so as a st standard sort of property of this six functor formalism is that if the map is smooth, so you can you can think of of of, uh, of x as a as a representable motivic space, then this is really the suspension spectrum of x, this this term in the middle. And then there's a mysterious map here that I call alpha f. And <clears throat> this here arises from a natural transformation from f lower shriek to f um, lower star. See that's sort of the only difference, uh, the only difference between these two terms here. We first we take an upper upper shriek and, and then a lower shriek and a lower star. So so this natural transformation here is what in, in induces this, this morphism. And that's what we take in the homotopy fiber of, if you like. And that's the this term here. Okay. So we mentioned before that if, if a topological space is, is compact and the singular homology at infinity is trivial and something similar happens here, if F happens to be proper, then this term here is gone. There's no homotopy type at infinity because then this map here is a, it's an equivalence, it's an isomorphism, right? So this last term here, F upper shriek, F lower star of the sphere over B, Right, I, maybe I forgot to say that this one B is this relative unit in, in SH is the sphere spectrum over B. And this is sort of the Borel Moore stable motivic homotopy type, at least that's appropriate if the base is a field. And more generally, we just call it the properly supported stable motivic homotopy type of X over B. Okay, that's a mouthful. Maybe I should stop for questions. I mean, what I want you to remember from this, this homotopy exact sequence is really the analogy between this, this term here and the singular homology at infinity. I think that makes it sort of looks pretty natural, our definition. Hey, uh, this is Zhao Li. Uh, I have a question. So for the concrete examples regarding the affine varieties, so if we take the compactification in PN, so can the Betty realizations as topological spaces be distinguished? Let's see which was the variety again. So the affine varieties you, you mentioned earlier in the uh, last page. Oh, the Danileski surfaces? Yes. Um, so, um, I think they're all contractible topologically. Ah, I see, I see, thanks. Yeah. But, but, so, and so, so we really need some sort of invariant that's not a homotopy invariant to, to distinguish them. I see, I see, thanks. Okay, any other questions or? Okay, sorry, okay, so. So this stable homotopy type at infinity has some nice functorial properties. So um, it's covariant for proper maps and contravariant for et al maps. And we can use the usual sanity checks with the motives and derived ab abelian groups to see that we actually have something non-trivial. So we can look at realizations. So let's, um, let's let X be smooth over a field say so we have a realization to um, to Obotsky's category motives dm um, and also to the derived category of abelian groups so here i guess i should should assume that f has a complex embedding to in order to have this map to the derived category of abelian groups and it turns out that by infinity of f over x this maps to um, something that has been studied in motives by, by Wildeshaus. So it maps to what I denote here by boundary of M over X. And this, this fits in um, distinguished triangle of motives. So Wobotsky defined the motive of X, M of X, and he also defined the compact motive of X. And then Wildeshaus sort of studied um, this term here that, that fits into this disti distinguished triangle in, in DM. And, and this is already a, a 
highly non-trivial invariant. So, so that already shows the, that there, there is a lot of information contained in pi infinity of, of X. And if you sort of push forward to, to D derived abelian groups, then we actually recover the singular chain complex of X at infinity. So that's a good sign, right? Okay, so here's another property that you might be interested in. So this is about analytic invariance. So you take schemes, say X and Y proper, and now we can be over a base, really any, any base B. And we have a map of closed pairs, say. So here C is a closed subscheme of X and likewise for W into to Y. And assume that this induces an, an isomorphism on all formal completions. So the formal completions, we can sort of think if, as a, as a tubular, tubular neighborhood of C around round X, if you like. And then it turns out, and this is an argument that's due to Wilder's house that he, he used for boundary motives um, before our work, that under these conditions here, the stable motivic homotopy types at, at infinity are, are, are isomorphic. Okay, so <clears throat> now if you want to, want to proceed in this theory, we, we sort of want to need to uh, impose more and more conditions on, on our varieties. So, <clears throat> so let's see. Um, let's, let's let X bar be a, a, a compactification of X. So X embeds in, into some proper scheme X bar. And it has a complement, the boundary of X. So this is just X bar minus, minus X. And I'm gonna assume that they're both smooth. And under that condition, we can talk about the normal bun bundle of the boundary in X bar. And then it turns out that we have a um, distinguished or another homotopy exact sequence. So now this, this homotopy type at, of X at infinity fits into this triangle here. We're now in the middle, we have the suspension spectrum of the boundary of X. And the cofiber is the suspension spectrum of the Tom space of the normal bundle. And this map here is also has an explicit description. This is called the Euler class of the normal bundle. And this was introduced by the Gleese, Chin and Kahn, the recent paper. So, <clears throat> So this gives us some hope of actually computing, right? Because if you want to compute this guy, then say we have some control about a compactification or, and, and also know something about the boundary. Well, then we have the sequence. So, so I want to take the sequence here and try to refine it in, a, in, a, in one example with some more conditions on, on, um, on X x bar and we're going to assume that this boundary now is a normal crossing device on x bar so this is a natural condition i mean you know somehow always arrange for this at least over fields where you have resolution of singularities and then we can break the boundary of x and we can write it as a union of irreducible components so so say that the irreducible components of the boundary of X is indexed by some set I and Delta I are the, are the corresponding irreducible components. Then we have <coughs> closed, closed immersions of the boundary into X bar. And now for any subset of, of I, call it J, we can sort of form a construction call it the J boundary of X, where, this in a, where we take the intersection of all the, of the uh, boundaries corresponding to the index J in J. And intersection here is, is not really an intersection, but it's more like a suggestive notation for the fiber products over the boundary. Okay, so we, we sort of form a fiber product depending on the elements in the, in the subset J of, of I. 
and if if we can if we now start varying j as well say j cont is contained in in k some other subset of, of, of i then we have a natural map from the sort of the k boundary to the j boundary okay so <clears throat> with this data we will start producing some um, oops sorry some diagrams in um, in S H O B. So now we have this J boundary of X inside the, the completion of X, and we we are we're entitled to a normal bundle of, of, of this here. So we let's just denote that by N J, and then to to fit the diagram into my this this pages, I'm just going to omit the suspension coordinates, and then we can just I mean, it's sort of simple to 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 observe that this the all the J boundaries they organize themselves into a into a finite diagram of this form here. So here we start with um, the I boundary of X, right? So this is just the intersection of the of uh, delta I of X, I is any element of I, and then we can continue like this here. We can look at J boundaries where the number of elements is just one less than the number of elements in I and so on. And then we get this diagram and the maps here, let's call them, I guess they're called face maps. So the face map from the, from the case boundary is really determined by, by this push forward map here, this lowest star. So in this formula here, K is fixed. And then we, then we find all the subsets, J of K, which has this property here on, the, on, on its cardinality, okay? And we could do something similar for all the, tom uh, all the tom, tom spaces of the normal bundles. And we can now, well, the bound, so the maps in the, in the systems are now going, given by an upper, upper shriek map. And then, our, I guess our main calculation shows that if we take the co-limit of this diagram star, then we recover the suspension spectrum of the boundary of X. In other words, this, this term in the middle, and we, we obtain the suspension spectrum of the Tom space of the normal bundle by taking the limit of this diagram here. Okay, so so the so in other words, this tom this tom class is really we, we can write it as a, as a map from a from a co limit to a limit, and there's one thing that sort of makes things or that makes it optimistic that we can compute with this here, is because there's a there's a natural map from this this very last term up here in this complex. So when we use, just used, um, use I as our index indices, and that's very natural because if you look at the I boundary of X, there's a natural push forward to X bar. And then we can go to this quotient of X bar by, by X bar taking out the, the I boundary of X. And this we know by purity is the Tom space of the normal bundle or the normal bundle here. Of, of the ix in inside x bar, okay? So the composite here, this coincides with the Euler class of, of, uh, of ni. Okay, so that's in some sense our main calculation. So <clears throat> I wanna end by some questions. Now that we have this, this construction and we know that the of course, this invariance contains a lot of information. We know that already by taking realizations. We can ask for sort of more explicit calculations. And this kind of goes back to, to work by Mumford in the, in the early 60s, where he used sort of similar techniques for surfaces to compute H1 at infinity, the homo first homology group at infinity. So one question, one sort of natural class of examples that, that we want to look at are the Daniletsky surfaces. So if you just look at in, in 
the, the A1 homotopy of the Nolesky surfaces. So the DNs, so every DN is, is A1 equivalent or motivic homotopy equivalent to, to a P1, to a copy of P1 and, or, or really the same, a line with two, with a double origin in. That's sort of how the proof goes. So, so we cannot really distinguish them in, in, in using any motivic homotopy groups or anything of that sort or motivic homology. But we're, we're very hopeful that we can use, say, homology at infinity or, or the stable motivic homotopy type at infinity to distinguish between the Donaldetsky surfaces. I mean, we kind of know that this must work because the realization is correct. Right. And then, of course, there are tons of other examples one can try to test this with. Um, <clears throat> and then I want to end with sort of another question, more remark, is that so far we've been working um, stably and we've been sort of been forced to do that because we, our approach was sort of an intrinsic definition of this stable motivic homotopy type at infinity. This requ requires the six functor formalism, which we don't really have the unstable setting. So a natural question is to define the unstable motivic homotopy type at infinity of any, any smooth affine variety, say. And in, this is really, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced that the, the most interesting motivic invariance sort of at infinity, whatever that means, will be constructed in the unstable setting, sort of similar to pi one at infinity, the topological fundamental group at infinity, that's, that's, uh, which is really an unstable invariant. And I want to just end by saying that the, the considerations on the previous page with this complexes and so on really depended on, on, on the fact that when we, when we look at the disjoint union of those irreducible components of the boundary of, uh, of, of X, when we take this disjoint union, map it back to the boundary of X, then that's, a, that's not an Snevich covering. It's a CDH covering. So in some sense, this, this was not so important in the, in the stable story, but that's just because SH satisfies CDH descent. And it sort of suggests that if you want an unstable motivic homotopy type at infinity, then it's, it might be better to work in the CDH topology rather than the Savisky or, or really the Snevich topology. Okay, so I think that's, that's it. Time's up there. Thanks a lot for listening. Okay, if people would like to unmute themselves, we can thank Paul Arna for his talk. Okay. Um,